Well, thank you, Allison, uh, for a kind uh, introduction. And, um, you know, I want to I want to thank Adam for his uh, friendship. And I want to uh, sincerely thank uh, Charlie for his honesty and um, courage and his uh, emotional uh, truth. Um, it was uh, just beautiful and um, painful, but 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 beautiful nonetheless uh, to be uh, a part of that. So thank you, uh, Charlie. Um, I mean, Allison, you had alluded to it in your comments that that's really the heart of my presentation this evening is to, you know, investigate stigma, the stigma that our culture places on upon people with substance use disorder, and to really elucidate the importance of uh, compassion and the uh, importance of empathy. And, and as I listened uh, to Charlie, I mean, that's what I felt, you know, the emotion was so true <clears throat> that it, it, you just have to allow it to resonate uh, with you. And, and it hurts. I mean, you, you weep, uh, you feel it, there's no getting away from it. And, um, you know, <clears throat> if you have empathy in your heart and compassion in your heart, you embrace it, because you realize uh, the value of it. Uh, without it, we fail to connect with each other. Um, sometimes pain and suffering are the price we pay for connection. And certainly um, relative to our topic tonight, um, that couldn't be truer. And um, it's out of that pain and um, suffering, that empathy, that compassion that, that comes what we see in, 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 in Adam and, and in Charlie. Uh, like a deep commitment to doing something about it, a deep commitment to make wrong right. Um, and that is what this presentation is about also, to, to uh, eliminate uh, stigma, uh, to unlearn stigma and to unleash uh, compassion, to unleash empathy so we can um, <clears throat> be in this together with our brothers, mothers, fathers, grandchildren, uncles, employers, employees, sisters, brothers, lovers, you know, who, who have addiction. You know, we can, we can reach out to them and, um, you know, <clears throat> include them. And, and treat them with dignity and give them the care that they need so they can get better like me. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 37th year of recovery. Um, I entered into my recovery when I was 37 years old. It's sort of this mathematical kind of like equilibrium going on this year anyway. But when I, when I what makes me fortunate? What makes me lucky? How come, how come I'm not deceased? You know, why am I one of the lucky ones? How many of the people that die every year, 70,000, 72,000 opioid stimulants, that's not even counting uh, alcohol and uh, nicotine. How many of those people would be alive today living productive, fruitful, meaningful lives like I am, if they would have had access to um, best standard of care when they needed it with no stigma attached to it over their lifespan the same way as other americans you know have access to other types of health care when when will we as a culture understand that addiction is a legitimate medical condition like any other legitimate medical condition and it needs to be seen that way and treated that way <clears throat> Those are some of the questions that I ask myself and some of the reasons that I do this work. <clears throat> so <clears throat> again, thank you, Adam, and thank you, uh, Charlie. <clears throat> <clears throat> you know, and, and, and Joey, you know, Joey's here with us, with us too. We, we, we know that. I want to recognize that. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I want to begin with my first this is, I, I want to share with you a story. It's my first experience of addiction. 
Um, it wasn't my own. It was before I developed full-blown addiction, but it was my first encounter with uh, straight up face-to-face -face addiction was right there in the car with us <clears throat> in all his majesty. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. Like Charlie was talking about moments being burned into your memory. This is a moment that's burned into my memory. <clears throat> and it's the story of Joe Basha. Joe Bash, Joe Basha. I was a kid from the Bronx. I was born in 1946. This story occurs around maybe 1963. So I was maybe 17 years old. <clears throat> and, um, you know, Joe Basha was, was like, like the alpha male, like the, he was like the God of the guys in the neighborhood. I mean, he was tough. That was his thing. Joe Basha was the toughest kid in my section of the Bronx. There was a joke that went around the neighborhood about Joe Basha. The joke was that Joe was born like a baby with like biceps, a baby with biceps and a baby with like a six pack. A little baby was born with biceps and a six pack. And the reason he was born that way was because he was the lucky heir to generations of Italian stonemasons and bricklayers and people who worked hard. And it all came out in Joe. He was just born ripped. And, um, and he was tough. Nobody messed around with Joe. What happened though, was uh, Joe developed heroin addiction. <clears throat> um, there was an influx of very uh, potent heroin in the Bronx around that, that time. And Joe was one of the kids in the neighborhood who was taken by heroin addiction. And um, at the time, there was no treatment available. There was no buprenorphine, no methadone, no alcohol counselors, no narcotics anonymous, none of that. <clears throat> there was a place in Lexington, Kentucky called the um, Narcotics Farm. <clears throat> Uh, we called it the farm. And people with heroin addiction would go down there, they would detox with maybe some medical supervision, and then they would get released and they'd come home. No follow up, no treatment, no buprenorphine, no nothing. They'd just come home. So Joe had heroin addiction and he went down to the farm. And we all knew that he was in Lexington, Kentucky. And we were all hoping, hope Joe gets better, you know, because, you know, he was our idol and we saw him taken by, by heroin. And it was, it, was, it was just traumatic for all of us, the toughest kid in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> so one night, my friend uh, and I are driving around, smoking pot, listening to jazz on the radio, driving around, doing the things we did. And there's Joe Basha, and he's, he's slagging us down. <clears throat> so we're like, whoa, there's Joe. So we pull over, and we let him in the car. And um, he tells us he wants to go to this guy's house, Scuppo. Scopo's house. So we go <clears throat> and we're like, oh my God, you know, we know why he's going there. Scopo is a, a connection. He lives with his mother, but he sells heroin. So, you know, we do what Joe says. We bring him there. He goes in the house and he comes out and his hand is kind of cupped when he comes out. And we see that immediately when we know what's in there. There's a set of works in there. Um, <clears throat> Back in the 60s, we didn't have hypodermic needles on the street. You had works. Works were like a, an eyedropper, a baby pacifier hooked onto the eyedropper, and one of those little uh, needles that medical professionals will you know, attach to the end of a hypodermic needle hooked onto the eyedropper. So it's a, a makeshift hypodermic needle. He's got one of those, <clears throat> and there's a hit of heroin in it. And he gets in the car, and he tells us where to drive this desolate place. And we, we you know, we drive him there <clears throat> and he wraps a belt around his arm. He's got a big vein popping out <clears throat> on his um, wrist. <clears throat> and he, he places that needle. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a needle, but the, the, the end of the needle is uh, very expertly beveled uh, to like the, the sharpest imaginable point at the exact right angle to pierce your skin and your vein wall. And um, he pierces, he, he, he places that needle on that swollen vein. And I don't, I don't, I, I think, well, Adam's an artist, so he probably knows. I don't know if other people know, but there's a certain uh, <clears throat> famous painting called The Scream by Edvard Munch. And uh, in it, the subject is this anguished human like subject on a bridge and his mouth is open and he's screaming this anguished scream. And uh, for some reason, <clears throat> the, the, the beveled tip of a needle uh, will always remind me of the mouth of the, 
anguished subject in Edvard Munch's scream. So Joey is, is poised this way with this needle on his vein, toughest kid in the Bronx. And what he does is he begins to breathe deeply. He begins to heave. Uh, then he begins to sob and cry in tears, uh, like coming out of his eyes and he's crying and sobbing. And um, because he doesn't want to inject this dose of heroin. He doesn't want to do it. Every fiber in his body is rallying against it, railing against it. <clears throat> and what does he do? He, he plunges the needle through his skin and through his vein, and, and then it's it's all over. And um, that, that to me, that memory to me um, is the epitome of, uh, it's the essence of addiction. You know, we, you know, people who see addiction through a lens of stigma call it a choice. They call it a, a moral weakness. Uh, they call it a criminal uh, personality. Some will, will call it a wanton uh, quest for, you know, just more pleasure. It's, it's none of that. It's a brain disorder in its own right. It incapacitates the person and it drives them to continued self-destructive behavior against their own will. That's the point, not a choice. This is why we need to understand how much these people need us. They're behaving in ways that they don't even want to behave. The least they need from us is punitive measures, punishment, incarceration, probation, things of that nature. So what the, the question begs itself, the question begs itself, why would a person, how, what is it that forces a person to do something like that? <clears throat> so in order, in order to understand that, you have to understand the dynamics of the human brain. And I'll, I'll go through it quickly, but, but I think it's worth looking at because besides speaking the right language and not using stigmatized language, we want to understand what happens in the person's brain, the person with addiction. So if you look at the human brain, our human brains are set up, they're beautiful, they're magnificent, they're the product of evolution since the beginning of time until this moment right now, they're always evolving. And, and some of the things that have been put in place over time are, are put in place for very specific reasons. They're put in place for basically two reasons, self-preservation and preservation of the species. So, <clears throat> there are behaviors that are necessarily more important than other behaviors. There's a hierarchy of importance when it comes to behaviors. Naturally re re rewarded behaviors are the most, uh, the highest on the hierarchy because they guarantee uh, self-preservation and preservation of the species. So <clears throat> self-preservation, like safety, uh, food, uh, water, uh, 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 sustaining, uh, uh, nurturing ourselves, self-preservation. Uh, it's very, very high on the, on the scale of, of, of important behaviors. Um, reproductive behaviors, sexual intimacy, bonding, attachment, um, you know, very high up on the scale of natural behaviors because it, it, it ensures the preservation of the species. The, the, the brain develops what's called incentive salience toward these behaviors because these behaviors are rewarded by the uh, release of neurochemicals more powerfully than any other behavior. So it's called incentive salience. So ironically and tragically, what happens in the brain of a person with addiction is it's those very functions in those very areas of the brain that are rewarded more highly by the self-administration of psychoactive chemicals. So incentive salience develops toward the acquisition, the self-administration and the experience of the drug effect. This is what happens with people with addiction. Now, if there are any people in the audience that have addiction or in recovery from addiction, they understand perfectly what I'm talking about. 
that drug experience becomes the most important experience in life, not by choice, but by virtue of the way the brain has organized itself because it's been exposed to the, to the chemicals. <clears throat> For the people out there now listening who have never had an experience of addiction, if you want to feel what it feels like, um, food and eating activate some of the uh, same sectors of the brain, some of the same processes in the brain. So if you want to do an experiment, don't eat. <clears throat> Just stop eating. Stop eating and see what happens to you. You will get to a point where you will be able to think of nothing other than food. You will begin to seek food and you will absolutely, you know, be craving and um, like, like intensely motivated to have food to the point where you can't stop yourself. You have to eat. That's what happens to people uh, with addiction to drugs. That's what happens in the brain. Um, it's uh, pathological. It's a brain disease. Uh, and it's uh, self-destructive to the point of death. And we all know that um, from our experiences of what's been happening in America over, over the past uh, you know, number of decades. So I just wanted to, I wanted to go through that before we move into stigma. So if you, if you understand brain disease and you understand addiction and you understand people um, with addiction, <clears throat> then you, you want to uh, describe them and speak about them and speak about their treatment uh, in terms that are respectful, mindful, empathic, uh, and reflect science. Stigma is the opposite of that. It's not respectful. It's not mindful. It doesn't reflect science. Stigma reflects fear, uh, misunderstanding, prejudice, bias, uh, misinformation. But unfortunately, stigma is the predominant way of seeing people with addiction. It's inf infiltrated our entire culture. So we're kind of born into it and we learn it. We're born into it and we learn it. And it's not our fault, really. We're being taught it. We're being taught it by our institutions. We're being taught it by our media. We're being taught it by our neighbors. Uh, it just it permeates our culture. So I wanted to take a brief look at um, uh, stigma. Am I okay in terms of time so far? I wanted to take a look at, at stigma. So, <clears throat> you know, what, 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 what is it? So, so basically it's, it's, uh, it, it's imposed usually on a, a group a subgroup of people who have been disenfranchised by the larger majority group of people who have power. And it excludes them, it shuns them, it mistreats them, and it uh, uh, takes away their rights. It's, it's, it's akin to um, a racism, a prejudice. It's kind of in the same ballpark. Um, when, when we look at substance use disorder and people with substance use disorder, um, if we first look at stigma on a, like a, a cultural level, I guess the best way to describe it is that it's a, it's a force um, that constrains opportunities, constricts opportunities. It constricts resources. It re deprives people of well-being um, <clears throat> in a systematic, systemic way. So cultural stigma prevents people with substance use disorder from uh, living full lives and exercising the rights that um, other people exercise every day. The most, I think, uh, blatant, clear example of it is the war on drugs. I mean, the war on drugs since what late 60s, early 70s has uh, proven to be a, a war on people who use drugs. Uh, if you look at the incarceration systems in America, you see that the great majority of people in jail today serving long sentences, deprived from their families, have their freedom taken away from them, have no opportunities and are incarcerated uh, because they have substance use disorder. And they're not even getting any treatment in there. 
So that is a direct result of like an institutionalized uh, stigma. Uh, akin with that, right alongside of that, you'll find discrimination toward people with substance use disorder and in recovery in housing policies, employment policies, uh, different types of uh, healthcare uh, access policies, all a result of seeing people with substance use disorder through a lens of stigma rather than seeing them through a lens of truth. <laughs> if you look at um, stigma as it manifests itself in individuals like me, like you, and it, it, I mean like everyone, there are probably none of us that are really um, 100% free of it because we've been born into it. You know, if you read about racism and, and um, um, uh, you know, different types of uh, uh, prejudice that have to do with race, and you really begin to take a look at yourself, you, you, you find out that inside yourself, you are harboring some prejudice or some racism because we've all been brought up in it. It's the same uh, with, with, with stigma. <clears throat> so individuals who see people with substance use disorder through a lens of stigma, um, see them in a way that um, causes like almost visceral kind of reactions, like a moral kind of an outrage toward the person with substance use disorder. Uh, they're seen with contempt is seen with uh, anger, disgust, uh, hate, blame, uh, you know, or the whole array of whatever negative emotions uh, you can imagine are unrightly, un unjustly placed on people with um, substance use uh, disorder. <clears throat> also, uh, people who see people with substance use disorder through a lens of stigma uh, validate um, false uh, stereotypes. <clears throat> These people with substance use disorder are bad. They're criminal. They're re recently a study was done that showed that um, just simply the word or the term uh, substance abuser would elicit responses that would indicate that a person who is a substance abuser or a drug abuser would be um, less likely to benefit from treatment, more likely to benefit from punishment more likely to be seen as uh, socially threatening, more likely to be seen as in control of the behavior rather than having symptoms of a disease. So all attitudes that kind of elicit like a, a punitive response toward the person with the, um, the disease. <clears throat> when it comes to looking at uh, people with substance use disorder and what happens to them uh, because of stigma, and this is this is a crying shame, and, and uh, I, I've seen it many many times, and, and and I'm sure you have too, that that people with uh, um, substance use disorder with addiction, over time will like internalize the stigmatizing attitudes of the general culture. So I am bad, I am worthless, I am, uh, a, you know a piece of, you know, blank, 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 blank. I'll never be any good. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I deserve uh, punishment. Um, and, and this is a kind of the shroud that they will kind of enfold themselves in because it's placed upon them by very powerful forces um, outside them. <clears throat> They will also um, expect stigma. They will anticipate stigma. Uh, they will isolate and feel shunned um, because of anticipating stigma. And um, in our context, the way we see our society today, especially with opioids and fentanyl contaminating the opioid supply, um, people who shun are shunned and isolate uh, and languish in shadows are, you know, at, at very high risk for death, at very high risk for death by overdose. And this is what we're, um, we're dealing with today. You know, <clears throat> I'll wax academic for a minute. <clears throat> uh, Nora Volkov, who's the director of the National Institute of, uh, I call it drug addiction, it's really drug abuse because they haven't um, changed the term yet. It takes an act of Congress actually to change the label. 
Mirabalkov recently cited a study uh, from a, like an Italian group of researchers who do um, uh, studies with la laboratory animals. And what they found is when they give uh, uh, heroin and um, stimulant dependent laboratory animals, the ability to socialize with other laboratory animals, they will self-administer drugs less and eventually stop self-administering drugs. When they couple, this is the important part, when they couple the uh, laboratory animals socializing with another laboratory animal with a mild electric shock, that animal will, will immediately revert back to the self-administration of drugs. It's their contention and my contention that that mild electric shock is the equivalent of social stigma. So you have a person with substance use disorder reaching out for help. And if the care provider is harboring judgment, harboring you know, negative feelings toward the person with addiction and the person with addiction perceives that, that negative shock of stigma causes them to withdraw, drop out of treatment, isolate and continue to take drugs. And they're blamed for dropping out of treatment you know, you're not motivated, you know, you, you, you really don't want to get better. Um, they're wrongly, uh, in, in very many uh, cases, wrongly blamed. <clears throat> so the ultimate outcome uh, of, of all of this, what we're talking about, the stigma, is shame, withdrawal, fear, isolation, the continued use of drugs, uh, the um, failure to, or, or not the failure, but the um, um, uh, reluctance to seek uh, medical attention and that may not even be accessible and um, perhaps overdosed in death. So what we're really speaking about is truly not, it's not a figure of speech that it is a matter of a life and death. So, you know, I know why I'm here tonight. I'm here tonight because I care. I know why Adam and, and, and Charlie and, and uh, Allison are here tonight. They're here before because they care. And I would, I would assume with great confidence the same thing about everybody in the audience. You're here before, because you care. Caring, caring can be a great burden. Caring, caring can be the burden of, I'm overwhelmed. People are dying. I care. What can I do? You know, what, what can I do? We have people like Adam and, 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 and Charlie who, you know, it's very clear what they can do. They're doing a lot. But, but, but regular folks, you know, what, what can we do? Are we doomed to feel overwhelmed and care and powerlessness? Well, my answer to you is no. And that's the last part of the, the, last part of the, the presentation really is on what I call silent, uh, softly spoken advocacy. Softly spoken advocacy. It's about the mindful choice of language to describe people with substance use disorder. <clears throat> the language that we use, the eye contact, uh, the, the uh, body language, the tone in our voice, all of this kind of like, you know, uh, blends together and sets a tone. You know, it creates a feeling uh, it, it communicates um, either empathy, or compassion, or stigma. So I'm just going to go over a few terms that we can all use every day to change around the atmosphere that we face in our culture. We're really uh, striving over the long haul by using language to change the envelope a little bit and um, it really is a type of advocacy because when we're speaking, people hear us, you know, and when we're not saying, oh, so-and-so is a worthless drug abuser, we're saying so-and-so is a, a, you know, a person, you know, with a family who's struggling with substance use disorder, you know, and, and how can we help them? You know, we, we, we're kind of setting a different tone and people hear it they pay attention uh, to it. So the first term I think I'd like to focus on is, um, well, it's a few of them, uh, drug abuser, addict, alcoholic. 
you know, the media has done, uh, you know, quite a bit of harm, you know, when you think of that word, addict, or alcoholic, you know, you get a, a certain view of a person, and, you know, the, the person, the whole person is an addict. Well, that's not really true. The whole person is a whole person with a whole life, with a family, with, with wants and dreams and aspirations and emotions and hopes and talents and contributions. A little, a little slice of the person has addiction. So the, 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 the language that we use to convey that is we use what we call person first language. Uh, Joe is a, a person with a substance use disorder. Person, a whole person with a substance use disorder. A whole different, it just feels so, so different. <clears throat> Sue is an alcoholic. <clears throat> it, has, it has such a final, uh, finite kind of a feel to it. No, Susan is a person with alcoholism. But Susan is a person who's trying to do something about her alcoholism. Maybe she's in treatment, maybe she's in therapy, maybe she's in AA. You know, there's so much more to Susan. Um, another one that I think we should look at is um, <clears throat> medical terms like, uh, you know, dirty and clean pee test. <clears throat> I mean, you know, this is a substance use test is a medical examination. It's just like any other medical examination. It deserves the dignity and the language that support valid medical examinations that we, um, you know, perform with our treatments of people with valid medical conditions. Uh, when we say dirty or clean pee test, it's like dirty is bad, clean is good. If dirty is bad, then bad elicits this idea of uh, punitive, I'll punish you. People with substance use disorder need nothing less than punishment, they need compassion. So so-and-so's um, drug use test was positive, or so-and-so's drug use test was, uh, was negative. <clears throat> um, I, had, I had some other examples. Um, <clears throat> doctor shopping, and I think this is a, a, like a, a good example because it, it kind of uh, is in line with, uh, you know, Charlie's presentation, you could feel Charlie's uh, pain, you know, for at the loss of, of his brother, uh, Joey, and, and you had like a, like a, it resonated with your ability um, to feel your own pain, your own compassion. There's this term doctor shopping, like, you know, when you, when you, when you hear someone's doctor shopping, it, it kind of is a snappy kind of cool term, you know, oh, they're going around from doctor to doctor, you don't really even take it seriously. When you consider what it, what it takes to get a person to actually visit multiple physicians, misrepresent themselves, take the chance of being found out, put themselves in a very vulnerable position, all to acquire enough of a psychoactive chemical to avoid withdrawal, what that feels like inside. That, that they're forced to do that against their kind of the value system. That's not in line with anybody's true value system. We're not taught to do things like that. When, when you begin to think of that, you begin to feel that person's pain, you feel that person's powerlessness in, in the face of their own addiction and you have compassion for them. Calling them a doctor shopper, just, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't get it. Um, so I would, I have a, a website that I gave out, Allison. It's uh, www.edbakermsw.com. And, and on there, there's a lot of resources for people. And there's a paper that I wrote called Softly Spoken Advocacy, which will, um, you know, again, treat the subject that we're treating tonight, but also includes a, um, an additional reading list for people who are, are interested. The last... Um, term I'd like to talk about just for one second is, um, you know, the uh, medically assisted treatment, or I like to use medications for opioid use disorder. <clears throat> um, buprenorphine and methadone are very frequently, very often called uh, either replacement 
or substitution. So opioid replacement or opioid substitution. And when we use words like this, we create the impression that the patient is merely substituting one opioid for another. It's like a lateral shift from an illicit opioid to illicit opioid. And um, it opens the door to stigma. So instead of using words like uh, opioid replacement or opioid um, substitution, we need to begin to use terms like medication for opioid use disorder uh, because it, it conveys more the medical um, essence of like treating this person for opioid use disorder. This is one of the groups. People with opioid use disorder on medication are one of the most vulnerable groups in, in America today when it comes to substance use disorder. And it literally breaks my heart to see them not only exposed to stigma, but exposed to like a double layer of stigma. The first layer is you're a junkie. You know, you're using heroin because you're a junkie and you want to. Now, <clears throat> getting over that one is no mean feat. Finding the wherewithal to seek treatment and seek treatment that's scientifically proven to save countless lives, but happens to be opioid based, to have that person who achieves that exposed to this second level of stigma which comes in the form of you're still using, you know, you're just not using heroin and fentanyl. Now you're using buprenorphine. To, to, have, to have people treated that way, this vulnerable type is, is really unconscionable. And I, and I, and I, and I really wanna impress us all. And, and I know the audience is I'm preaching to the choir uh, but I want to impress us all with what we already know that it's really, and this is what I mean by softly spoken advocacy, and I'll wrap up now, is that, you know, it was 2014, I was at a conference in Cape Cod on the Symposium on Addiction Disorders. And I was with a group of uh, colleagues, and a few of them were from ASAM, and a few of us were psychotherapists. And we were trading vignettes like you do after a workshop. And I brought up a vignette about a, a case study of a client I had who was an addict. And I, I told the story. And after I told the story, we broke up and, you know, we went our own merry way. And, and my, my, my colleague approached me and she literally pulled my coat. She said, Ed, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. She said, you know, when you were telling that little vignette about your client, uh, you characterized him as an addict. And I said, yeah, he was an addict. He uh, had an opioid, uh, opioid addiction. He was an addict. And she said, I understand that. But she said, you know, there's a group of us, this is 2014, there's a group of us who are beginning to use person first language. We feel that words like addict and drug abuser perpetuate stigma. And we're going to do something about that. So I want you to take a look at that. Now, that was 2014. She approached me as a softly spoken advocate. And ever since then, I've been studying this. So I would like to urge our participants tonight to like take an internal pledge to not only, as they're probably already doing, use language that's mindfully chosen, but also take on a little bit of extra responsibility to kind of approach people and educate them about the importance of this. This is something we all can do. All right, so I guess I probably talked too long. <laughs> hey, Ed, can I, can I, I wanna, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I, I wrote it in the chat, but I didn't know if Ed saw this. I don't know if you remember this, Ed, but. I mean, we met, we sat on a panel together in Burlington. I was invited from the Burlington. You were sitting aside of me and I was using the word addict a lot in what I was saying. And you did the exact same thing for me in 2017. And since then, every place that allows me to speak, I give them the same charge that you just gave me there. So you changed my view 
And I just want to say how honored I am that you're here. One thing Ed always says to me, um, I, we text back and forth, especially in like the really hard times. Um, and he always says to me every time he ends it with um, shoulder to shoulder, oh, which uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that, that means the world to me. And that's, you know, when Charlie says at the end of that, that bit that, or that, the, the bit, the, yeah, the story he tells about Joey, and he says something about me being strong. The only reason that I'm able to do this is because I can lean on your shoulder and I can mm -hmm. lean on Charlie's shoulder and Allison's shoulder and the folks from Troy and all the people that, you know, I can't lean on the shoulders that I want to. My brother Joey's huge shoulders are the ones I want to lean on, but I get to lean on your guys's. And so Ed, this tonight was really, really special. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. And you know, the feeling is certainly uh, as deep and mutual coming from me to you and, and also for Charlie now and Allison also. Thank you. Ed, I have a, I have a question if, um, <clears throat> if, if I can monopolize. I'm sorry, Allison, I saw you put the charge out there for people. But uh, and maybe, maybe this is the wrong lens through which to think about this, Ed. But to try to be a good advocate, I think about the kind of response I'm normally going to get when I try to build uh, compassion and empathy towards people who are suffering with su substance abuse disorder. And in some ways, I feel like I, I'm very, very capable of meeting people who are at a place of like, this is wrong, it's disgusting, it's self-destructive, it's their choice. Like, although that's difficult to hear, I'm used to hearing that. And here's, here's the question. In Philadelphia, and I think other than the fact that Alice and I trust each other and respect each other as artists and creators very much, the city is being ravaged uh, by opioids. And at the same time, we were very nearly close to being the, the first city in the country to have a harm reduction site through Safe House. Mm -hmm. And the reason that didn't happen was community-based protest against it, like grassroots protest. And some of it was your standard, you know, not in my backyard kind of thing. But the voices that got the most press were actually people with direct empathetic connection to those who had died. People that, you know, loved ones and relatives who knew these people better than anyone and thought that this a level of empathy that would normalize this, their words, normalize this idea, is actually something that's equally as destructive. And I don't know how to begin conversations with people who are in that place. Does that make sense? And I'd, I'd love some some insight if you could share it. So they, they, they think that a harm, a harm reduction site would normalize taking drugs. <clears throat> is that what you mean? Yes, and ultimately enable more deaths because of it. Yeah, you know, I mean, we, we see many attitudes of uh, that nature. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, a real uh, solution. You know, in Vermont, we're looking at, um, I guess we're calling them safer, safer consumption uh, sites. And, um, there was, uh, it was definitely not going to happen. And um, since then, the health commissioner and the, um, uh, I guess the federal level uh, attorney general and uh, the attorney general of Vermont have really changed uh, their tune. And we're looking, uh, you know, really closely at research and how we can implement that uh, in, in Vermont. And, you know, you have to, I mean, one of the hardest, and I know you know this, uh, Charlie, um, one of the most difficult pieces is, you know, like not giving up, you know, providing research, um, waiting sometimes for the, the, the um, circumstances to affect people who are resisting in ways that kind of opens them uh, a little more, you know, to to what what seem to be really progressive and and um, life saving ideas. It, I mean, it is controversial, but you know, back when um, needle exchanges uh, began, you know, uh, when AIDS 
was was uh, you know uh, you know becoming more and more out of control. Uh, you know, people began to see the benefit of needle exchanges. Now in Vermont, you know, needle exchanges is just like run of the mill. Fentanyl uh, testing strips, run of the mill. Uh, 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 access to buprenorphine, you know, immediately in emergency rooms and at harm reduction centers. Um, we're doing it all the time. The uh, there was uh, the uh, just uh, the the state's attorney, the mayor of uh, Burlington, and the police chief of Burlington conspired outside the law and agreed to not uh, charge um, people with addiction for uh, illegal possession of buprenorphine. <clears throat> You, they won't. They won't charge you, even if it's not your buprenorphine, because we know that you're probably using it to, you know, treat your disease. So I mean, there, there, we, we, we move forward in in strange ways. We, we can never, uh, we can never give up. Why, why, why people with? I think you said this was the people with the most empathy and the most compassion were feeling the most against this idea. Uh, because they felt that this would normalize drug taking. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it certainly, um, if they look at any of the research in Canada or Europe or any other places where these things have, you know, uh, become the norm, they'll see that it doesn't cause uh, people to take drugs and, and it in fact saves lives. And if it's located, uh, you know, like in a, in a in a building or a storefront where other services you know can can be offered you know it, it pulls people countless people into treatment we have um safe recovery here in Burlington a harm reduction <clears throat> needle exchange fentanyl uh, strip exchange uh, wound kits uh, buprenorphine things of that nature very very informal they get a lot of people coming in there who will not go to the more formalized uh, treatment programs, <clears throat> and uh, they've made hundreds of referrals uh, to the um, more established <clears throat> uh, buprenorphine treatment programs, and uh, they take great care to make personal referrals and in-person kinds of, you know, just give somebody a, you know, a name and a phone number. They'll make a personal referral, and, um, you know, it, people, people like you're talking about who feel compassion, need to kind of hear about that research. They need to hear about those examples and what these things can do in, 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 in communities. I mean, that's really the most I can say about that. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, speaking a lot about uh, Vermont, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, and, and you've touched on this a little bit already, but, um, you know, Ver Vermont is certainly uh, exemplary uh, in its approach to uh, COVID-19 right now. Your numbers are great. Um, and, you know, we've, we've certainly become aware that uh, the isolation um, around the, the pandemic has um, led to a led to a spike in, in overdoses and deaths from overdose. And, you know, I just wonder if if you're seeing um, better numbers in, in Vermont, more positive uh, connection to that, that socialization that you were mentioning earlier. No, oh, you know, I, I attend a meeting every month. It's, uh, they call it community statistics. It's with uh, <clears throat> the mayor of Burlington, the police chief and all the different people from all the big treatment providers. And there's just a number of us, we get together faithfully every month. We've been going for years, every month. I never miss them. And, um, one of the things that we focus on is fatalities. <clears throat> and um, we dig down into it. We, you know, we will, you know, we'll talk about who died and how they died and uh, what they overdosed on and um, what, what kind of, uh, you know, interactions they had with different systems and, and, and what we could have done better and what we can do better. And, uh, you know, why did this happen? And, um, you know, and there could be one or two a month, uh, you know, that we're looking at. And um, so I'm, I'm aware of what's happening in, in, my, in my area. 
And unfortunately, I, I cannot report that um, we're doing better. Um, this, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic has, um, it's, I mean, for a while there, it was hard to get into the hospital. You had to go through like a barrage of, uh, you know, gatekeepers to get into the building. So, you know, people, you know, already discouraged became more discouraged and um, uh, some treatment, uh, you know, became a more or less accessible uh, than usual. And uh, I think people become uh, a little more depressed and a little more isolated. And um, we've seen a spike in overdose uh, fatalities this year. And it was after we had seen a, a marked uh, decrease and, um, you know, we, we, we didn't uh, sustain the decrease long enough to actually be able to dig down into, you know, what's working. We were just kind of like doing a lot of things and, and they, they seem to work in unison to really decrease, to begin to decrease overdose fatalities. But COVID-19 has, um, has, really, has really disrupted that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question um, from uh, the audience. Uh, what do you say to 12-step advocates who are opposed to medication-assisted treatment? Seems like that's another aspect of stigma. Yeah, you know, um, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I am a 12-step uh, advocate and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very active in the program. I, I, I entered into the program in, in July of 1984. And uh, I sponsor people, and I go to meetings, and I, I do everything. <laughs> I do everything, and, and I, I, it's very rewarding uh, to me, spiritually, spiritually rewarding. And um, I can remember uh, in in the past, you know, you'd get these uh, hard liners that would, uh, you know, kind of misunderstand you know, abstinence, and uh, they would actually discourage people with severe depression from, you know, taking their medications for depression, you know, and, and um, you know, that happened for a while. If you look at the AA literature, it, it, it doesn't, it does not advise that, but you'll get some people who, they just, uh, I don't know, they, based on their own prejudice or their own fear or their own uh, stigma or bias, they act like it's, you know, like accepted uh, AA or NA uh, policy. And, um, you know, what I believe is that, you know, buprenorphine and methadone are like any other medication. They just happen to be based uh, like in, 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 in an opioid um, base. So if you look at what the medication is supposed to do in, in, the, in the right dose and titrated to the right dose, the, the opioid will attach to the mu receptor in the brain, the opioid receptor, in a way that uh, will prevent the person from going into withdrawal. So there's enough opioid to prevent withdrawal, but yet the dose is below the intoxication threshold. So the person won't be intoxicated. So they're not going into withdrawal and they're not experiencing intoxication. They're stabilized. So they're stabilized. So now the person can go to an AA meeting and can read the big book and can pray, can do the things that we do, can, can, um, call a sponsor if there's an urge to relapse with an illicit drug. And this is a, a, a drug that provides a, a stabilization. Um, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing in our literature that says anything uh, that would cause a person to really believe that a person on a legitimate medical prescription uh, should be seen as any less uh, in recovery than a person not on a legitimate medical prescription. If you look, if you look, uh, was the Betty Ford um, Institute uh, had a panel convene on uh, the meaning of recovery a number of years ago. And if you look closely at it, 
one of the components of recovery is abstinence. And they define abstinence as, you know, abstinence from all illicit chemicals or using um, all, all, all from, from all abstinence is, you know, abstinence from all psychoactive chemicals. Um, and a person can be prescribed buprenorphine or methadone and still have achieved abstinence, which is one of the components of recovery. As long as they're not, you know, misusing their prescription. So the, the Betty Ford Foundation, which has been like a leader in the treatment field for years, you know, actually tackled that one and came up with a, an educated opinion on it. So I, um, I would just refer those, uh, you know, people with, with that view to, toward the literature, toward the science. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's nothing uh, more you, you, can, uh, you can do. We have even, I mean, in, 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 in Burlington, the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I can say that to this group, this is not, you know, uh, uh, press or anything. The Alcoholics Anonymous meetings that I go to are, are very liberal uh, in nature. And, um, you know, if, if we have someone in there that, you know, isn't, isn't uh, you know, their primary drug is not alcohol, but is opioids, we we welcome them with open arms and and try to try to support them as much as uh, as much as we can. Um, <clears throat> in AA, they say the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. So you know, once we start messing with that, or you can't be a member because you're a woman, or you can't be a member because you're black, you can't be a member because you're LBGTQ, you can't be a member because you don't have an income that's high enough, you can't be a member because of this or that. You know, we would die. We would die. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, period. That's in our traditions. Doesn't, you don't have to be abstinent from uh, a prescribed medication to be a member. Somebody, um, somebody's getting a little bit on a high horse there and, and they should get off that horse. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, we have a couple more questions uh, lined up here in the chat. And if anybody else has anything, please feel free uh, to jump in or, or share it in the chat. Um, question uh, from early on, from earlier in the, in the conversation. Um, will decriminalization of drug use in America end stigma? I don't know if it'll end stigma, but it'll end mass incarceration. And that's a step in the right direction, let me tell you. <clears throat> You know, you know, decriminalization, I think when we talk about decriminalization, we have to define what we mean by decriminalization, because there's decriminalization, which I am all in favor of. You know, I was a kid who was arrested in the Bronx, um, uh, charged with possession of marijuana with intent to sell. Must have been 1964, I was a kid. And uh, the Rockefeller laws had been passed in New York State. They were like the precursor of the war on drugs. Marijuana was and still is uh, considered a class one narcotic. <clears throat> so you got this 17 year old kid who gets arrested for possession of marijuana with intent to sell, looking at the Rockefeller laws, <clears throat> mandatory jail sentence. You know what I mean? It took me, it was like a, 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 it really impacted my life. Instead of getting treatment or probation or talking to or what have you for, for the beginning of what was to end up a 24 year addiction, I got like a punitive response, almost went to jail for a long time, was placed on probation and um, no treatment whatsoever, punitive response, treated like a criminal, almost, almost went to jail for a really long time. Um, and it set me off on a 24 year spiral into drug addiction. I, what, what happened was I, I left New York State uh, I, and I went to California and that's where I was introduced to intravenous uh, drug use. But um, <clears throat> it was because I was treated like a criminal. I wasn't a criminal, I was a kid who smoked pot. Um, <clears throat> 
So I think we need to take a, a close look at, you know, who is being um, arrested, who is being incarcerated, who is being treated like a criminal, who is internalizing all that kind of treatment, who, who, who is having years taken out of their lives and being placed in, in jails where there's nothing good happening. Decriminalization, I think, of, of uh, I, and I, I'm not, I think it, it looks, if you have a kilo of heroin, uh, you know, I think you should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law because you're making money preying on people. There has to be a way to distinguish between what's decriminalized and what's not. But, but in general, I'm in full support of decriminalization. I don't think that people should be uh, treated like criminals and incarcerated uh, for possessing small amounts of drugs. Now, I say that, and I, and I, and I just want to take a, another minute, because there's decriminalization, but now there's also commercialization. And the two things get mixed up a lot. <clears throat> I'm in favor of decriminalization, and I'm opposed to commercialization. In other words, right now, we have opioids, we have alcohol, we have uh, uh, nicotine, you know, we have, we have, we have like this quite a few, um, um, you know, psychoactive chemicals out there that cause death and addiction that are commercially available. Now we have THC. We have it in Vermont now. It's not, we, we already had it. It was already decriminalized. But the, the forces that are pushing this kind of confuse people and, you know, decriminalization, you know, equals commercialization. Now we have commercialization. So we're going to have shops in Vermont selling a high potency THC. It's the wrong message to the kids. It's the wrong message to society. I'm completely against it. I don't think, I don't think um, the commercialization of, of psychoactive chemicals is is uh, like like a, 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 a wise expansion to make, given the context of what we're already dealing with, and all the promises are made. You know, Purdue made promises. The alcohol companies make promises. The tobacco company makes promises. None of them keep keep their promises. If you look at the research, uh, it's probably about twenty percent of a psychoactive chemicals producers customers uh, are responsible for 80% of their profit. So who, who is that 20%? That 20% is tragically the people with addiction. And that's, that's the way it is with psychoactive chemicals. People say uh, uh, THC is uh, less harmful than alcohol. <clears throat> well, you know, alcohol is... Uh, one of the leading causes of uh, preventable death on earth. So because something is safer than that makes it okay. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. So I, I'm in favor of decriminalization of small amounts of psychoactive chemicals. Um, uh, and I'm opposed to any further um, uh, commercialization of, of, uh, of the sale of psychoactive chemicals. <clears throat> You know, and I saw, uh, I thought of you, I, 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 I got to find it and send it to you, but talking about this commercialization, someone sent me this image of a billboard out, I don't know where it was at, but they were talking about, it was like, if you choose to use THC, you have, you know, it's like a, it's like a 30% chance uh, better, uh, either, I don't know exactly how they broke it down, but basically they were hinging one tragedy off of another, right? So it's selling weed, by talking about the woes of opioids. And I saw yeah. that and I just, it's, yeah. it's all there, right? That's, that's, that's it. It's, it's, it's all about how I can package and commercialize this in a way. And I, I, just had, I was just saying to my Charlie and my dad here before, you know, we got onto this, you know, like one thing I'm finding to be very true in America is that, you know, and I, I say this a lot is that I don't think the government remotely cares if we use drugs, they care who we buy our drugs from. So it's, it's, it's how can we package this? How can we sell this? 
Um, and in Pennsylvania, I mean, they're talking, their deficit is terrible because our government is atrocious and it's the biggest in the country. Um, and because they've done a terrible job, their solution to ballots in the books is legalizing recreational marijuana to do that. Um, and it's just, I, I, and again, I, I think that, I think, again, I, I agree, like laying the foundation of this change on bringing something into our, back into our society that can actually deteriorate it further doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. It yeah. seems like it's going to make the job harder. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I agree. Plus, I will say on a side note, I think that, you know, uh, having um, imbibed, imbibed in some of these new, uh, this new marijuana that's available, it's not what it was when I, in the 90s, when I was buying it. It is significantly stronger. And I, I would also question um, the fact that it's in any way safer than alcohol. Um, it's pretty, it's, 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 it's a much more potent, it's a young man's game is how I, <laughs> I would say it right now. Yeah. And, and the, um, the, the THC uh, potency increases the addiction risk and the addiction potential. So, I mean, we're, we're looking at a, a highly, um, you know, there's a lot of addiction potential in the type of THC that's going to be available in the community. And that's not an accident. That's on purpose. That's going to increase profit. And like you said, you know, states are looking at, you know, shortfalls, you know, especially with COVID-19. So this is a way, but, but, but in all the states where this has taken effect, I don't think any of the profit uh, has really materialized the way they thought it was going to materialize. And um, I was very surprised in Vermont. It was a very close vote for a very long time. And the legislators seem to have gotten distracted by the logistics. Oh, maybe we can regulate it and we can control it. We can test for it this way. We can do this and that. We can set it up and have all these different kind of like boards to govern it. And we can, it's going to be safe and we're going to make money. And they, they um, if you look at their deliberations, um, they, they, I don't, I, I, I don't think they consulted with any health uh, science uh, professionals, that really wasn't their focus. Their focus was more the logistics and the funding and how we're going to roll it out and how can we regulate it. But but they they forgot that no matter how they roll it out and how they regulate it, it's a, it's a profound uh, uh, public health risk, no matter how you cut it. <clears throat> you know. Yeah, thank you. I, I think maybe we have time for one more one more question. Um, and uh, this actually uh, brings us back a little bit to, to stigma. Um, and the question uh, that was posed earlier is, um, how much did stigma grow in our country after the start of the war on drugs? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think the war on drugs is intimately connected with the development of stigma uh, toward people with substance use disorder. And I think that was intentionally, all the, the terminologies, you know, drug abuser, drug abuse, you know, the idea of uh, people uh, being arrested and, and um, you know, convicted and sent to jail, you know, as criminals rather than having a, a, like a brain disease or a brain disorder that could be treated. That, that whole uh, kind of sentiment, that whole approach is very much uh, connected with the war on drugs. Um, in fact, and it was, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to understand, but the bureaucracy is like a glacier, you know, it, it moves so slow, if at all, sometimes. It was um, 2013 that the Obama administration convened a summit uh, at the uh, Office for National Drug Control Policy. And it was in 2013, late 2013, that they officially abandoned the war on drugs as a policy. So we're talking about 2013, it's 2020, almost 2021. Uh, the war on drugs has not been abandoned. It was abandoned you know, in policy form. And it was at that summit uh, that they um, agreed to take a public health approach and educate the public about this uh, idea of addiction being a disease. And also at that summit, they noted like the, the, the formidable uh, presence of stigma and how they would have to do something about it. And they noted the value of changing uh, language to come into a line with this scientific view 
of addiction as a disease. So you had a lot of leaders who came in line with this, but it's really been, you know, a little bit of a shortcoming of my field, you know, the addiction field to get, to really get robust about getting this information out there to the general public. We, we, there's a, uh, a definite uh, lack uh, in the transmission of what we know to knowledge that we uh, provide people. Um, the one, one thing that happened that was really good was, and it's in that uh, suggested reading that I uh, had mentioned, uh, Vivek Murthy, who has now been appointed by uh, President-elect Biden to be on his uh, COVID-19 um, task force. Vivek Murthy was the Surgeon General under then President Obama. And Vivek Murthy in um, 2016 issued uh, the Surgeon General's report. And the title of it is uh, Facing Addiction in America. And, and I do believe that it's a Surgeon General's report that will go down in history. It's akin to um, the Surgeon General's report that focused on uh, smoking. And it's akin to the Surgeon General's report that focused on AIDS. It's like a landmark report. And, and in it, um, he, Vivek Murthy takes great pain to talk about uh, stigma, to talk about this idea of uh, addiction being a disease, a treatable disease that people recover from, that they become productive citizens if they're given the right kind of medical treatment. So it was, again, the, the bureaucracy at a very high level, you know, you know, getting some skin in the game. But, um, you know, it just hasn't really taken effect in the way um, that, it, that it needs to. And a lot of it is because we've seen decades that came before this, and the decades were colored by, by the war on drugs. And um, the media, you know, uh, movies, uh, television. Um, I, I think Adam knows a little bit about like incarceration became sort of a, a huge uh, private uh, enterprise. I mean, just there's a lot of very powerful forces uh, feeding, feeding on that idea of um, stigma. Yeah, I mean, there, I think that that statistic is, you know, we have the America has 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And that's a direct result of the war on drugs. And a lot of those, a lot of those prisons um, are, are private, and they they make a ton of money off of having incarcerating folks. So it's not about just locking them up for use. It's about bringing them into a system where they're working for 31 cents an hour to build things for the government or to do, there's, there's a, a lot of money to be made in continuing to keep our in, incarceration numbers as high as they are. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a, man, that's a whole other talk for sure. So we have, we have a lot of uh, like as a team us and in our audience and, 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 and many, many thousands of Americans, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, work to do uh, going, going forward. And I know, Adam, that, that, you know, you're one of the people that I admire because of your, um, your, 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 your deep uh, commitment, you know, and your deep uh, resolve uh, to organize yourself around this. It has that much meaning uh, to you and there there are many of us there are so many of us <laughs> that are that are in this uh together and we're making we're making progress even though it's, there are some days where it doesn't seem like we're, we're doing so well we're, make, we're making progress and um we just have to keep our eye on the prize and keep on keep on moving forward shoulder to shoulder <laughs> it's true i love that yeah um well, I think that's that's a pretty phenomenal note to send us off into the rest of this week. Um, so, I, I, you know, I just want to thank you, Ed, so much for, for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, Charlie and Adam, for this project. 
Um, I want to thank our partners, Troy Foundry Theater, uh, who are with us tonight and um, all the work that they've done, the original production um, and the continuation of, of the work. And, and um, shoulder to shoulder is <laughs> the way to do it, is the way to do it. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and please, you know, stay safe this week and, and take care of yourself and, and all of those around you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody.